So Matthew 22, Psalm 110, John 5, 1 Corinthians 15, John 10. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, I thank you for the many blessings that you've given to us today. And I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with the health that we have. I thank you that you have blessed us by being the God that you are. And what a blessing to know that you do not change, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I thank you, Lord, that you do not lie. And I thank you, God, that we can trust you because you have shown yourself to be faithful. You have shown yourself to be true and that you are the truth. And Lord, I pray that this time would magnify Jesus Christ, that he would be lifted up for all to see. And I pray, God, that, that we will grow closer to you through your word, knowing that our faith grows through your word and through the hearing of your word. And God, I do pray that your Holy Spirit would work on our hearts. Draw those that do not know Christ as their Savior and help those to draw ever closer to those that do know Jesus Christ. Bring us ever closer to you and conformed unto him so that we would be like him and have his mind as we go out into this world. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Matthew 22, we're going to be down at verse 41. Matthew 22, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Now what you have been seeing, if you read through Matthew, you see that the Pharisees have been questioning Jesus Christ. And they've been questioning Jesus Christ. And they've been questioning Jesus Christ. Why? Because they want to try and catch him in a mistake. They wanted to get Jesus Christ to say something that would give them something that they could accuse him of and attack him with. A lie, a contradiction, anything that they could use against Jesus Christ. The Pharisees wanted to silence him, and they wanted to discredit him before they could lose any more credibility among the Jews. Jesus Christ was a threat to the Pharisees because he was preaching what God had called him to preach, whereas the Pharisees were more interested in maintaining power, maintaining their status, rather than glorifying God. And so as the, the Pharisees were huddled together, scheming for their next question, Jesus Christ interrupts them and asks them a question. And he asks, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Now, first of all, what is meant by Christ? Christ is a title. It means anointed. It means the Messiah, the Savior that the Jews have been long looking forward to arriving. He's the one that was chosen by God. Of course, Jesus Christ is God. But the idea of anointed, if you read through, especially in the Old Testament, and when uh, someone was anointed, 
What that meant is that they had a flask of olive oil and they would pour it over the head of whoever was being anointed. That's what happened with uh, Moses' brother. His name just went right out of my Aaron. head. Aaron. Aaron, thank you. <laughs> when, when he was made the high priest, they anointed him. They poured oil over his head. When Saul, the first king of Israel, was anointed, they poured the flask of oil over his head. And that was a sign that they were being chosen. And, and oil was a, in a lot of ways, a sign of honor, especially olive oil, because of all the work that has to go into harvesting and then squeezing the oil out of olives. And so that meant that they were the anointed. And, and that's what the Messiah was. He was looking for that Savior. The Jews were looking for their Savior and, and the Old Testament prophecies spoke of the coming of the Christ and that the Christ would save the Jews from those that would oppress them. The Christ would come and establish his kingdom here on earth. And the Jews looked to the Christ coming and being the conquering hero that they needed. And so Jesus Christ, he asked them about the Christ and the lineage of the Christ. And what we have to keep in mind is that when Jesus was walking this earth and during his, his 33 years here on earth and his three years of ministry, he didn't walk around and say, hi, I'm Jesus Christ, if you will. Okay? He would have been known as Jesus, son of Joseph, or just called Jesus. I always refer to him as Jesus Christ because that's who he is today. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. Amen. And so um, that's why I end up referring to them that way. But they would have just seen him as Jesus. And so when he's asking that question, what think ye of Christ and whose son is he? They understood what he was asking in there. And so he's asking them about the Christ and the lineage of Christ. And they answered, as you read there again in the middle of chapter 22, verse 42, they say unto him, the son of David. So in other words, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed would be in the lineage of David, the second king of Israel. And this is part of the prophecies of the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel, David had been told by the Lord that David would always have a son on the throne. And there was a reminder of this in Psalm 89, verse 35, where God says, Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. And then the Lord used Isaiah to further confirm that the seed of David would always remain on the throne of David. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And then again in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, I just, I better back that up for a second there. When it says there, come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, Jesse was David's father. And I can remember, you know, growing up and in during the, the Advent season at our Catholic church, they would have a, what they would call a Jesse tree. And they would hang envelopes on it, and it was supposed to be, you know, you would take an envelope and, Try and help somebody that needed some help, you know, for the Christmas season. But Jesse is David's father. And then, um, and so, again, Jesus Christ is through that lineage of David. So the Pharisees were correct that the Christ would come from the line of David. Because God had promised David that he would make that happen. And so when you read through the two genealogies that are in Matthew and in Luke, 
Each one points to Jesus Christ as having a legitimate claim to the throne through David. These genealogies feature Mary's side of the family and Joseph's side of the family. And we have to remember, to the Jew, genealogies were very important. And that's why, again, when you read through the Bible and you'll see this person would be referred to as Joseph, the son of this, who was the son of that. You would see that all through the Bible. This was very important to them, the genealogies. And the genealogies are what point to Christ being the Savior. And Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of these prophecies. And one day, he will soon return to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And so what think ye of Christ is, for the world, the eternal question. <clears throat> what think ye of Christ is the test to try both your state and your scheme. You cannot be right in the rest unless you think rightly of him. As Jesus appears in your view, as he is beloved or not, so God is disposed toward you, and mercy or wrath are your lot. The Pharisees refused to accept Jesus Christ is the Christ. Even when he directly told them that he is the Christ, all that did was just stir up anger on their part. And Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And people that do not have the correct view of Jesus Christ are sadly lost. They have not been born again. Those that have rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior are condemned and destined to die in their sins. All right, look again at verse 43. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? So we've just read Jesus Christ's full answer to his own question, but let's look at it in smaller pieces now. All right, so first of all, how then does David in spirit call him Lord? Jesus Christ is quoting from Psalm 110. And you can never go wrong with quoting scriptures. Go over to Psalm 110. We'll be back to Matthew. Psalm 110, and again in verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at thy, my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So Psalm 110 is recognized as what's called a messianic psalm. In other words, a psalm that's about the Messiah. It sings about the coming Messiah, because we have to remember, the Psalms were meant to be sung. Even the Jews of Jesus Christ's day believed that this Psalm pointed to the coming Messiah. And so in Matthew 22, verse 43, we find out that David wrote Psalm 110. If you were to look at, at um, some Bibles, they won't necessarily give the attribution that they do, like in my Bible, it says Psalm 110, a Psalm of David. Not all of them end up doing that. Uh, mainly a lot of the older ones. But Jesus Christ is the one that said this one was by David. And, and with every Psalm that David wrote, he wrote it as moved by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you can say that David in spirit wrote Psalm 110. That's answering part of that, what Jesus had said. How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? He called him Lord because that's what he was moved to call him. <clears throat> now the question Jesus Christ has for the Pharisees is how could David call his son Lord? And the reason behind that is because the son is not supposed to be greater than the father. Since the Christ is supposed to come from the line of David, David would therefore be greater than Christ. Now, what do I mean by the, with the idea of greater? In other words, even though, oh, I have a son, and, and 
ultimately, I'm supposed to still be in an authority over him. Why? Because he's my son. Now, he could go on and earn a billion dollars and be a, a tech mogul and, and own all kinds of wild things. He's still technically under me because he's my son. I'm, under, I'm still his authority. Likewise with my dad, who has passed away. But if my dad was still here, I would be technically under his authority as well. Even though I may be much less than him financially or whatever else, he is still my authority, if you will. And that's the point that they're trying to make in all of this. Since the, that, since the Christ is supposed to come from the line of David, David would therefore be greater than the Christ. Now, obviously, we know that that is not true, for we know that Jesus Christ is greater than all. Keep your finger here, but go over to John chapter 5 now. John chapter 5 and drop down to verse 18. John chapter 5, verse 18. And all of this deals with, again, the thinking. We have to remember, this is a Jewish book. You know, that, that the people that wrote it were Jews for the most part. You know, and, and they were writing from the perspective of Jews as moved by God. And like I said, lineage and everything else was very important to the Jew. So John chapter 5, go down to verse uh, 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, talking about Jesus Christ, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So the Jews, they understood what Jesus Christ had just told them. And they were ready to stone him. They called it blasphemy that a mere man would equate himself with the Lord God of heaven. And here Jesus Christ points out to them that the Son is obedient to the Father and acts as the Father acts. Think about it, you know, when, when if you've had a son, what happens? That son wants to act like the Father in a lot of ways. You know, when they're little, they want to do the same types of things. Now, thankfully, I didn't have a son that said, oh, I'm going to act like a retail salesman or anything, but, you know, the idea is that the son will act as the father will act. They'll do the same types of things. And, and that's what Jesus Christ is saying, is that he is obedient to the father and he is going to act as his heavenly father would have him to act. And during his time here, Jesus Christ was always perfectly obedient to God the father. Look down at verse 30 in John chapter 5. Jesus Christ said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. So Jesus Christ, he never sinned, and he perfectly kept the law that was given to Moses. Nobody else could do that except for Jesus Christ. All right, keep, we're done in John 5. We will be to John 10 at some point, but go over to 1 Corinthians 15 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15. We're going to be down at verse 24. All right, so through all of this, what we have to keep in mind is some key points. Jesus Christ is God. And that's always a hard thing for people to fully grasp. And of what we're looking at today is pointing towards the Trinity. And the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
These three are one. Excuse me. And the scriptures show us the Trinity and at the same time show us that God is one God. And, and the Trinity, I'll admit, the Trinity is a difficult concept for us to fully grasp. And, and it takes a little time and it takes a bunch of faith in there as well. And what we're going to see here in 1 Corinthians 15, and we will see that Jesus Christ will conquer all in the end, and then he turns everything over to God, and that the Son is subject to the Father. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put, have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So how can these things be? How can you have that Jesus Christ is God, and yet what we just read here, that Jesus Christ is going to conquer everything and then put every, turn everything over to God? It can only be explained because of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are separate, and they are one. It also answers the question that Jesus Christ asks here. If David call him Lord, how is he his son? Because the Son is not supposed to be greater than the Father. And yet David calls his Son Lord. The only way that David's son can be greater than David is because the son is more than just David's son. <laughs> and just as a clarification here, the Messiah is not David's direct son, but the Christ is David's descendant. Jesus Christ is in the lineage of David through Mary and through Joseph. But what makes Jesus Christ superior and unique is the virgin birth. Jesus Christ is greater than David because Jesus Christ is of the seed of the woman. Remember the prophecy way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Jesus Christ is of the seed of the woman. And when you think about biology and everything else, it's the man that has the seed, not the woman. That's what makes Jesus Christ's birth unique. Because again, if you remember, Jesus Christ, it tells us in Matthew that he was placed into her womb. He was incarnated into her womb. That's the seed of the woman. So Jesus Christ was placed in the womb of Mary, and that also placed one that is greater than David into David's lineage. And when Mary was told that she would bring forth a son, the angel told her in Luke chapter 1, and the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So Jesus Christ is greater than David because he is the Lord. The Pharisees refused to believe Jesus Christ, even though he spoke as no man ever spake, and he did miracles that nobody else could ever do. All right, so go back over now to Matthew 22. We're done in Corinthians. Matthew 22. And look at verse 44. Matthew 22, verse 44. And look at that first phrase there. The Lord said unto my Lord. Now look closely at your Bible and notice that there is a difference 
between the first use of the word Lord versus the second use of the word Lord. In your Bible, hopefully, it's all um, capital letters with the first Lord. And then the second Lord is a capital L and lowercase o-r-d. These are deliberate distinctions. You know, when, they, when the King James translators translated the Bible, they did this deliberately because it's two different words. In the, du in the New Testament Greek, well, in the New Testament Greek, there is no difference between these words. It's the same basic word that's there. However, in the Old Testament Hebrew of Psalm 110, verse 1, there is a difference between the two. The word Lord, all in capital letters, is translated in Hebrew as Jehovah. The second word, Lord, is translated in Hebrew as Adonai. Jehovah said unto my Adonai, is essentially what it says. Now, Jehovah means self-existent and eternal. Adonai means sovereign and Lord. And it's a fascinating thing when you read through, especially in the Old Testament, you see God referred to in so many different ways. And you see so many different names attributed to God. You know, we have the one song in our hymnal, Jehovah Sidkenu, and, and you know, the Lord, my holiness, my righteousness. And um, there's so much depth to the Bible that we learn when we take the time to fully read it. And so what we see with this is my, the Je Jehovah said unto my Adonai. And what this is saying here is that God is speaking to God. Because there's no other eternal beings in this world. It's God speaking to God. Well, wait a second. How can that be? More specifically, the Lord is speaking to the Messiah. Because when you read the rest of Psalm 110, you will see that the Lord, Jehovah, is speaking to the Messiah. And reading it, when you read that in the context, and what the Messiah will end up accomplishing. Not yet, but it will be accomplishing down the road. So David is calling his son Lord in 110. And the son can only be greater than David through supernatural means. Again, the virgin birth, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So David, in the spirit, was given a glimpse of a conversation between Jehovah and Adonai. And that is what Psalm 110 is about. The plans the Lord God and the Christ are discussing. What you have here are two personages of the Trinity speaking and also seeing them as one. The first Lord, Jehovah, and then note that David says, My Lord, that is the second Lord, Odonai, that David looks to in a sense. And so it's, like I said, it's, fully, it's hard to fully describe the Trinity, and people have tried all kinds of different ways, and we're going to spend some time next week talking more about the Trinity. But, but the Trinity, people will use phrases like, well, three persons. No, because persons isn't the same thing. And um, because God is different, God is unique, but we can only try to describe him in language that we use. <laughs> but he's beyond all of so it, it does make it more difficult to understand. Now, in the Bible, you won't find the word Trinity itself in the Bible. What you will find in the Bible is the word Godhead. And so sometimes some people, when they want to talk about the Trinity, they stick to using that word, the Godhead. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, in reference to Jesus Christ, Paul wrote, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are three, and they are one. I don't say three persons. I don't say three entities. They are three, because that's how the Bible describes it, and they are one. So Psalm 110 is God speaking to God, and what this also fully demonstrates is the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. All right. 
Matthew 22, verse 44 again. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So Jesus Christ right now is seated on the right hand of God in heaven. Mark 16, verse 19 says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. The right hand is the position of honor. It is the position that is given to those that deserve that honor, and that's Jesus Christ. So he is in heaven, he is God, and yet he is in some fashion seated at the right hand of God. And we know from, again, reading the Bible, especially as we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, he is going to return, and all will be conquered, and Jesus Christ will then turn everything over to God the Father. And so remember, as we read through 1 Corinthians 15, we saw how Jesus Christ and God are spoken of separately, and yet the Bible also shows them to be one. And so Psalm 110 shows us that God the Father is speaking to God the Son. And it is of David's writing as moved by the Holy Spirit. And as we have seen, the question Jesus Christ <coughs> asked the Pharisees, if David then call him Lord, how is he his son? The son cannot be over the father except through special circumstances. So the Pharisees, they were now in a quandary. They were in a difficulty. What do we do? How do we answer this question? Because if they answered the question truthfully, <coughs> they would have to admit to the deity of Jesus Christ. They would have to admit that Jesus Christ is greater than David. And they refused to believe him. They did not want to believe that. All right, keep your finger in Matthew. Go over now to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, go down halfway, verse 30. John chapter 10, verse 30. So in the context of this, Jesus Christ, he's speaking to the Jews again. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus Christ says, I and my Father are one. You know, you would think right there that should settle it. But what ends up happening? Sadly, the Jehovah's Witnesses look at that verse and they'll say, oh, that means that they're of one mind. They think alike. No, it means that Jesus Christ and God are one. They are one. Verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So consider this. Jesus Christ just told the Jews that he and God are one. They understood what he meant, and that is why they wanted to stone him, because of what they perceived as his blasphemy. And this would have been a big step for the Jews, because the Jews were not supposed to execute anybody on their own. They had to get permission from the Roman government before doing that. And they would have been in a whole lot of trouble with the government if they had stoned Jesus Christ to death. That's how seriously they took what they perceived as blasphemy by Jesus Christ. If there was not the Godhead, the Trinity, would not Jesus Christ's statement in verse 30 seem odd? I and my Father are one? Would that make sense if there was no Godhead? No. And think about all the times that Jesus Christ refers to his Father. If the Godhead was not true, then why would Jesus Christ speak like that? I and my Father are one becomes a nonsensical statement. It just would not make any sense unless Jesus Christ is God and he is God the Son in the Trinity. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 14, verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father, 
and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. <clears throat> so what you see within the Trinity is that you have three that are distinct, and at the same time, they are one. They are of one mind, and they are of one thought. There is no arguing between them. They are united as one and as three. So, you may be thinking, well, why is this important to understand? Because without the right view of Jesus Christ, you're not born again. And that is very important, therefore. So why do we need to study things like this and look at things like this? What is it going to do for me in my life? When you think about the magnitude of what happened on the cross, we spent, what, 15, 16 weeks going through getting Jesus Christ from the, the garden to the cross and then his resurrection. We spent about 16 weeks preaching through all of that crosses the pivotal point in history when you think about our timeline you know and all the years and everything what are they based off of death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ the birth also you know and that's why they're fighting so hard to change things from uh, AD and BC to uh, was it before common era error era and after common era. Why? Because they want to deny Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is the center of everything. And when you consider that Jesus Christ is God, and that he died for us on the cross, that makes it all the more important. Jesus Christ was not just some man, which is what some people will say. <laughs> that he was just some man, and that he was born by normal birth, and that at some point he became deity. No. Jesus Christ has always existed. And so when you consider that he left everything of heaven to come to this earth, to leave that perfect love that the, the, the Godhead had between themselves, to leave that perfect love, to live on this earth as he did. You, know, you think about right, right now, if you were to walk through our parking lot, can you imagine walking through our parking lot um, barefoot? Or with just sandals on? And with all that melted snow out there and now it's turned to mud, you wouldn't enjoy that. That's what Jesus Christ walked through every day for 33 years. Now that may seem like a small thing. Well, it was just walking around barefoot. But how many of us really like to do that now? Jesus Christ left so much more. He was born on this earth in, in the poorest of regions in the poorest of areas. And Jesus Christ walked among us. He learned one of the lowest professions you can learn of being a carpenter. And yet Jesus Christ is a king, is the king. He's the Lord. Amen. So we have to have that right view of Jesus Christ. And the fact that he then walked this earth, he lived a perfect life, a sinless life, and then went to the cross, willing to die for you and to die for me because of my sins. He was sacrificed because my sins require a payment. Just like if you were to go to a store, you go to a store and, and you shoplift something. And just as you leave, they catch you. What will they often do? They'll expect you to pay for it. That's what Jesus Christ, our sins, require a payment. So Christ died on the cross so that I don't have to pay for those 
sins that I have done. Jesus Christ paid it all for me. He was then buried, and then on the third day, he arose from the dead. And that showed that, Jesus, that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So that I can now one day, I believe on him now, and one day I'm going to have eternal life with him in heaven. Amen. Whether it's through the rapture or through my death, my own, I know I'm going to be with Jesus Christ. So that despite everything that can go on in this world, and how difficult this world can be sometimes, and will get difficult there later on, it's all going to be meaningless because I'll be with Jesus Christ in the end. Amen. And that's where my hope is. That's where I keep my eyes pointed is towards him and not towards this and that and the other thing. What's happening in the government? What's happening in the world? What's happening with the Bilderbergs? What's happening with who? It won't matter in the end because I'll have an eternity with Jesus Christ. And so... That's why these things are important for us to, to understand. Can we fully understand the Trinity? No. But we can understand as much as we can, and we have faith that God that knows what he's talking about, that God is sovereign, that God is in control. And so this is important for us because we see the depth of what God went through for me, for you. And that makes me all the more gratitude, grat gratitudinal. How's that? I'm all the more thankful to him for what he has done. It staggers me to think about that. And that he's willing to let someone like me still into heaven. Wow. That's why it's important to know these things. And to consider that God himself gave up his life for you is very humbling. And let's pray. Our God and our Father. Again, I thank you for this time with your word. And I thank you, Lord, for the truth of the Bible. I thank you, God, that every bit of it is true from in to amen. And I pray, Lord, I pray that we would be reading it and rereading it, growing in our faith of you, knowing what you have done and knowing what you have promised to do and knowing that Jesus Christ is our rock. And God, I pray as we go through this week, we would stay close by your side, that you would help us, that you would give us your wisdom daily, and that we would use that wisdom for your glory. And Lord, I pray that daily we would trust you, knowing that you will bring us through only the shadow of the valley of death, and knowing that you will never forsake us. And God, I pray, pray for so many out there that don't know you as Savior. I pray that your word would work on those hearts, draw them to Jesus Christ before it's too late. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.